the work that you guys are doing is remarkable. And it makes me very hopeful. But, but this can't be a movement. It has to be a change of life. It has to be, we're going to change the world. We have to make a commitment um, to change, change our, to change the way we live our lives. We have to lift black lives up. We, we have to, we, we don't have any choice. And that's not a short term gain. That is a, a lifetime commitment. The world will change um, because of what you're doing. So I just want to share with you, number one, you're going to have to be an immovable object. You're, you're, you're not leaving this, this, this is a way of, this is a choice. It's a way of life. You're committed to this. And that's the end of that. And number two, you, in, in making that commitment, you will succeed. And, and trust me, 99% of the world is movable. It is. And the reason is because they haven't made a decision to be immovable. It is a choice that you make. And that is, I'm not moving. I'm not giving ground. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to wake up every day and do my best, but I'm not leaving this fight. I'm going to stay right here. This is my life. Please be an immovable object on this. And, and you will change the world. You will succeed by not giving up. You're, you're not backing down. You're going to wake up every day and do the best that you can in that day. And that's all it takes. And eventually you will move the world in rhythm with your thoughts and your deepest desires. My heart is more open and my heart is more raw. And I hope your heart's open and become perhaps a little more raw today as well. I can't, I can't wait for you to hear from them. Really incredible leaders from the market centers in our region. They have opened my heart wider than I thought it could be uh, widened. They've helped me understand where I'm still blind. They've helped me experience a life that I couldn't experience based on the color of my skin. Uh, they've helped me love more. And so we're going to talk about the past. We're going to talk about the present. And then we're going to talk about the future. Many of us might think we know the past. I think you might get enlightened about where we've uh, skimmed over some parts that are pretty important. Then we're going to talk about the present. What, where are we now? What are the circumstances and things we're up against? Um, what's Keller Williams' role in that? What's this industry's role in that? Um, and then we're going to talk about the future. Like, where are we going? And when we get to the part about the future, you're going to hear uh, more specifics about Keller Williams' uh, really quite incredible commitment and the GPS that they've put forward um, and the actions that we are all uh in, uh, implementing at a market center and regional level. Holding a man's suit. My father was fitting him for suits. I think suits were about two for five dollars back in those days. It wasn't all that long ago. So I said to my grandfather, I said, you know, I noticed that the only people you're pulling happen to be white people. All right. Now, why only white people? And he said, well, black people have no need for a suit. I was five years old, and I'll never forget that. I'm a little older than that now. Because that was, and that wasn't even considered hatred. It was considered normal. It was considered that's the way you are. You lived in your neighborhood back then and before then. And you never really went down to the other neighborhood. And people kind of respected those divisions. So, Dean, now, I think that's so important, too. I just want to yeah. just. And that's the history. I think people who have an immigration story in the in America, in this country, seem to understand neighborhoods and the grouping of ethnicity in neighborhoods to be preference. Right. right? Because exactly. that has been their experience. We had a parish here, and so we all kind of lived around here. We all spoke the same language, and so we all kind of gathered here. For Black people, there was it was not a matter of preference. It was a matter of law, violence, um, and you know systems. So pe when people hear about systemic racism, they they you know they don't it, they don't want to hear another buzzword, which I understand. But what's behind that custom. buzzword is a lot of actual systems, laws, practices that were in place. So post-civil rights, 
into my life, all of the white people left. And when people talk about what happened to the neighborhoods after white people left, they often, I think there's like an affinity or affiliation with like, because the black people came and then the, the property values came down. It is, it takes, t- realtors know it takes two sides to do any, every transaction. Right. And name a neighborhood in the city that would not be negatively impacted if everybody in the neighborhood, the real estate community and the homeowners, all decided in the period of like a few years to get out. What would happen in the years that came after such an action? Instead of support, when people were released from bondage after slavery, they were not given support. And so I just hope that people can look at what they do on a daily basis when they think about bad neighborhood, safe neighborhood, that you begin to examine how you got those those thoughts. The other side of town, and I never had to be exposed to this on the same basis as Rosalind has and so many others have, it was, it, was, it was silence. In the end, we'll all remember not the words of our enemies, not the words of our enemies. You'll remember the silence of your friends. Mm-hmm. That the biggest issue in our society is that we all have not taken a seat in the room. We're all wandering around the room, touching the seats, wondering where our friends are sitting, which seat are they in, which seat are you in? And, and I tend to believe that there's enough people to do all the good the world needs if we all sit down in the seat we want to own and own it fully. Um, and so, like, part of what you can do on social media is define your seat and then own it and be a, a beacon and an example for others. I find myself, like, vacillating on how to show up. But what I know is it's important to show up. And then you'll get it right over time. I'd rather show up and do it a little wrong and a little messy, but be in the conversation than not be there at all. In order for us to talk about the present, we also have to talk about how we arrived here uh, because I think there's a tendency for us to think, oh, once laws are passed, then that totally corrects everything. And we know that's not, that's not the way the world works, especially in real estate. Uh, so a lot of what Stephen and I end up having to do uh, when we talk with our, our clients, especially our black clients, especially first time, first time um, homeowners and or people who have had some negative experience in real estate is we end up having to be both a real estate consultant and a counselor because what we don't consider is the trauma of all of these historical things that have happened in real estate. You can only undo um, through systematic ways, what has been brought forth through uh, systemic ways. You know, there was a study done by two sociologists, one from the University of Pittsburgh and one from the University of New Mexico, where they studied appraisals back in 2018. And they saw that appraisers, more times than not, when you, everything else was equal to condition of the homes, crime and everything else, they appraised Black homeowners' homes for less because race went into their appraisal process. And that was 2018. 2018. If you become a, a Black homeowner, well, you still have the same access to capital when it comes to refinancing and, and leveraging real estate. Or are there still some residual effects of the way the system was set up initially that you have to fight against today? To so Especially as a Black agent, that we call it a black tax because I have to now take more time to make sure that the system is working for my clients the way it works for everyone else and also let them know that it's safe for them to participate in the system. And that takes extra time. So I, you know, it, when you when you go into this, you go into it knowing that, hey, I may not be able to do the volume of business that some of my other counterparts are able to do because I have to take on additional work that they don't have to take on. And again, we sign up for it. It just I think it just needs to be known that, you know, when you do sign up to do anything and, and you do it with the right intentions, you know, that there are costs associated with it. Um, yeah, you know, our minority clients, 
um, yeah, it's it's a deeper education, right? And it is um, now. There's also the part of it as well of giving that good news. It's like, oh no, you you think you have to rent, but no, you actually can buy. My mom, she was doing the best that she could for us in bringing us up and trying to move us to a, an area that could afford us more opportunities, right? One of the things though with my mom as she did move us out of the city um, to try to afford us more opportunities, but my mom in her mind, as many blacks as Marcus had already alluded to, in the mind you think, that, no, I, I can never own a home. That's not, that's not part of my future. No matter how hard my mom worked, she felt that, that that's just not reality for her. You know, she, uh, us being in an apartment complex on the, you know, the smaller side of the, the neighborhood and, and that just wasn't reality. And guess what? She didn't mean to, to pass that down to her children, but that gets passed down. We have to educate, we have to defeat this mindset that unfortunately some blacks have. So growing up around all white people, not many blacks around me, you know, I often had to actually be silent. You know, there's a black joke here, a black joke there. Um, early, when I was just, when I was younger, you know, the first time I was called out of my name, the N word, I was five years old in kindergarten, grabbing a crayon. No, that's my crayon N word, right? So at a young age, this happened to me. And, you know, and then I grew up fighting, right? But then I had, couldn't keep fighting, right? And then it went to silence. And then I realized more and more as I understood who I am, I'm like, I gotta speak up. I gotta, I got something to share, right? One of the questions in the chat is, what can we do to help change the trajectory? Um, you know, as a white person in this, in this meat suit, uh, which affords me an experience that is unrelatable to the one you have, what can I do to be an instrument of change? How can I help? I think, I think by, as a, as a white person, by putting yourself in, forcing yourself to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And like, I was so amazed when we, when the uh, George Floyd murder happened, I was so amazed at the number of white people who said that they didn't realize this was an issue. And, and, and that, 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 that shocked me. And what I, what I stopped to do, instead of being angry about that, I thought, okay, what must it be like to go through the world and be white and not have, and, and there are certain things you can, you can ignore. You can, you can, you can put blinders on. I know as a man, there's certain things that, my wife and daughters talk about that I can put blinders up about just because I'm a man that doesn't affect me. Well, but should it affect me though? And I just want you to think about what it means to actually serve the entire community in which you reside. And if you're really about that or not, um, there are their trainings. We, we, we're a training focused company. We have models and systems. And I think sometimes the models have and systems have baked in a, a, view, a view of the world that is subdivisions, suburban, non-urban, non-complex real estate environments. Everything is not built for everything, right? But I think as individual business owners, we should think about how we answer when someone asks about a an area that we don't know about. If you and if you are a rainmaker and you're building a team and your team is not reflective of where you live, that too is a problem. Your team should be diverse. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with a diverse population. Mm -hmm. Ross, real estate has to be about the client. So if I have a black client and I don't understand their fears, that's what I mean that it can't be about the che the check. It has to be about your client. But but you need to understand first time home buyers black. They have fears. To make Keller Williams the number one workplace for diversity 
equity, and inclusion across all industries as validated by a third party. So not ourselves, right? We don't get to say it ourselves. It has to be validated by a third party. And our national task force main goal is to increase black Asian count and leadership by 50% in one year. But I'm not going to apologize. I am through being apologetically black. I'm proud of who I am. Amen. And I'm not going to apologize. And if you're uncomfortable, then I'm doing something right because you need to be uncomfortable to learn. Because for too long, you have been too comfortable and not thinking about how uncomfortable I am. Mm 